Thank you for downloading the latest episode of Historical Hot or Not. FYI, there was a slight glitch on Kath's audio. Some kind of weird digital clipping on her voice here and there. I couldn't get rid of it, so I apologise for that. Um, but I hope you enjoy the episode anyway. Enjoy. They might be a Viking or a Saxon or a Roman, but tell me, do you like them? Would you sex them? Would you bone them? Would you go to bed with King Ethelred? Would you bonk? William the Conqueror up in the sheets with Samuel Pepys. Mussolini was a meanie, led a fascist insurrection, but does he make you creamy? Does he give you an erection? Would you pork Richard the Duke of York? Does a boner start when you think of Bonaparte? Are you sexually aroused at the thought of Pol Pot? Historical hot or not? Hello and welcome to Historical Hot or Not, the only fans for history stands. My name is Aidan McCaffrey, I am not a historian, and this is... Catherine Mather, and I am also not a historian, but we are comedians who are horny for history. Oh yes. Today we've got a special guest, Ooh. Mm. we're joined by the comedian David Eagle. Uh, David, are you a historian? Oh, we're going to say, are you horny? Um, and that I, no i'm not a historian i think that's the qualification uh, for this podcast is that you are not a historian so i am qualified kind of as long as you have the horn for the past i think you qualify oh yes david uh eagle's name may be somewhat already known to regular listeners of this pod because in fact you have already heard david's voice on this very episode because david is the composer and performer, being as he is a musical comedian, of the historical Hot or Not theme tune. Would you sex them, would you bone them? I am, and, I, and I'm aware that some people tune into the podcast just for the theme tune, and then when they hear you two, they turn it back off. Uh, many people have said that to me, Aidan. It's a, no, hey, hey. Don't worry. <laughs> Genuinely, a download's a download. If people are actually doing that, I am more than happy with that. As long as we get those sweet, sweet stats, I'm, I'm game for it. It's all good. So yes, David, you're a musical comedian, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm aware that's a very impossibly vague question. You've been on the Now Show, that's right, isn't it? I have on Radio 4, yeah. That's the doing the, the current affairs stuff. So that's quite daunting because you don't know what you're going to write about. So something happens that week. You just hope that there's going to be something in the news that happens that week that conveniently relates to a subject that you've got loads of material <laughs> about. You're going, oh, come on, you know, and then something happens and you go, hey, oh, brilliant. Oh, oh, no. And you've got to try and you try and shoehorn in existing material because otherwise you've just got to write new stuff. And it's kind of like doing a, a new material comedy night where you say stuff for the very first time on the knowing that it's going out into the, um, you know, you're performing it in the BBC Radio Theatre with a lot of professional comedians, and then it's going out the following day on Radio 4. Imagine doing a really bad set and it not going well, and then going, <laughs> well, at least, at least at some nights you can go, well, that's it, I've done a bit of a rubbish gig, but that's the end of it. Here I have to go, and now it's going to be out on Radio 4 the next day. So... <laughs> it takes me about 60 gigs to get a material just right. So the idea that, mm -hmm. like, the first live performance of a new new set of jokes that I'd written uh, would be immediately broadcast to the nation fills me with an absolute threat. <laughs> you are a hero, David. And as well, I think you, you need to hope for a new story that is big enough that you've got angles on it, but mm. not like a tsunami. Or, you know, a landslide into a school. I have a lot of tsunami, landslide, natural disaster jokes. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, it probably wouldn't be appropriate. I feel sorry for the musical comedian that was booked to go on the Now Show on September the 12th. I mean, what materials he got to work with there? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And also, the other thing is, is then not worrying that you, you do the material and then just, if it goes well, just thinking now there's going to be like a disaster or something and that, and, and I'm never going to be broadcast. Because if, if the, um, you know, if there was some sort of disaster or something happened and that meant that the show wasn't going to be broadcast, they probably wouldn't put it out again. Potentially, because no. it's like, well, it's not topical anymore. Imagine if I did a really good one and then was like, oh, it was unbelievable. Like people were crowd surfing me around the room <laughs> and, and, and the producers had to say, stop it, because he's going further and further away from the microphone. And it's creating like a weird Doppler effect and it's going to make listeners very dizzy. Uh, and then it never gets broadcast. So when you, say, when you say you hope that the current affair story of the week relates to something you've already done, does that mean like you hope when you go on that, say... Rishi Sunak has killed his dog for Satan. 
and you can be like, ah. I've got my Killing My Dog for Satan song. Boom. Perfect. And sadly, <laughs> it never comes together, does it, David? I do have a Killing My Dog for Satan song. Yeah, the, kid, the song Killing My Dog for Satan, <laughs> the best that it ever went down, weirdly, was at a Christian festival. And I was in a tent with a thousand Christians and they were all joining along. With, so, wow. with with absolute glee. So, uh, I mean, it was quite a liberal Christian festival. I, I'm not joking when I say that the following day they had Richard Dawkins as the speaker there. So oh. it kind of gives you oh. an idea of what kind of a Christian festival it was. But it was definitely a, a, it was definitely billed as a Christian festival, but it was great. They had something there as well called Beer and Hymns, which I just love oh. the sound of. Beer and Hymns, because it just sounds really oh laddie. You know, like you can imagine like hymns delivered as if it was like on the terraces at a football match. I kind of really <laughs> like that idea. And people drinking and getting more and maybe then having a bit of a fight about transubstantiation or some kind of religious thing or <laughs> something like that. I like how like laid back this is. Like you've got Jesus and beer in one tent and the next tent you've got God and Coke. And the next tent yeah. you've got Virgin Mary and Blow. Sounds pretty great. Maybe Bloody Virgin Mary. Where you read, oh. you've got the rosary whilst having the Bloody Virgin cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> Beer and him sounds like something that Weatherspoons would do on a Sunday, <laughs> the Easter Sunday, <laughs> Beer and him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> where you get a pint for one ninety nine if you sing a full round of Shine Jesus Shine beforehand. Yeah, yeah. We will be doing maths, <laughs> but you can have a Foster. <laughs> It's not just wine that they have been out. Yeah, and then if you come back in the evening, you can uh, do the christening and curry that they do as a sort of nine ninety nine <laughs> combo deal. And um, you also, would you say it's a folk musician or is it a jazz musician? You're a folk musician in a band called the Youngins. That's correct, isn't it? I'm a folk musician. Pe people call it a j jazz music when we keep making mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and we just say, no, this is jazz. <laughs> but when you're doing it exactly as it was on the page, it's folk. Then we call it folk, yeah. Yeah, it's like, no, I didn't play the wrong chord. I was doing a freestyle jazz improvisation around the C minor chord, actually. Well, folk music, obviously, one of the things that we do is, um, you know, that's grounded in history, folk music, because, you know, that's what, that, the, there are songs that survive because they've been passed down from person to person, from generation to generation. Um, and so, and obviously those songs change over time, but you get a real sort of insight into different cultures and, 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 you know, how England maybe was in the past through from the from the perspective often of, of the ordinary person because obviously throughout history it's the it's the wealthy that you hear from or the powerful that you hear from so folk music gives you a bit of a glimpse into the how the maybe the ordinary people live that's a really good point but i don't want to be having sex with no historical peasants <laughs> i hope you've got someone rich and powerful for me david i hate to disappoint you but that even if we present you with like a tudor queen their teeth are still going to be falling out of their gob. Like, I think if you go back far enough, there is no real distinguishing cleanliness between the upper and lower classes. So, sorry, if you want to stick your dick in something clean, you can go on the People Who Are Alive Now and Bathe Hot or Not podcast. This is historical hot or not. And they're all right. absolutely this, fucking filthy. So this is, this is less Simon Sharma and more Simon Shafter. Exactly! We're yeah. totally stealing that, David. <laughs> totally stealing that for the next intro. <laughs> More Starkers than Starkey. Anyway. Hey. <laughs> David and I also, uh, we went to university together, didn't we, David? Yeah. Which has sort of created a little bit of an ignominy for me because, like, not, uh, and we were friends in uni as well. It's not just like we were passing hall. We hung out and we would have poker nights together and stuff. But this has created a little bit of an ignominy for me because not only am I not only the, not the most successful comedian to come out of Hull University. I'm not even the most successful comedian to come out of my six-person poker night that I would host every Sunday <laughs> night. So you, you're really showing me up, David, with all the success you're having. Oh, but you were a much better poker player, <laughs> in fairness. I mean, <laughs> I, I wish I could say that I was taking home tens of thousands of pounds on those poker notes, but the fact is we were students, and if I came home with 14 pounds, I would consi have considered that a good night. So. <laughs> And I didn't get invited to any of these poker nights, so I'm I'm kind of hurt, well, I'll be honest with you. But you weren't in our university, in fairness. No, that is true. So I'm pretty sure you were 14 at this time. So if I, like, showed up with a 14-year-old oh, yeah. mank girl, people would have found it <laughs> really fucking weird. But Aiden, I don't know what's going on here, but none of us are really comfortable with this. <laughs> Yeah, I think my dad would have had something to say if you guys would have rocked up at my house and just been like, is Catherine coming out? Where? 
Who no. are you? <laughs> uh, we can't tell you, but tell her to bring money. We're going to try and fleece her on the poker table. <laughs> <laughs> For new listeners, and indeed for David, who may not have listened to this podcast, the format of the pod is thus. It is historical, hot or not. We are going to look at a photo, or a painting, or maybe a cave drawing of someone from history. We will assess them aesthetically. We will uh, objectify the hell out of them and say whether or not we would have sex with them. But then we will look at their personality to see if that swings it either way. Sometimes we reject them aesthetically, but we say yes after learning about their wonderful personality. Well, one thing we've not mentioned is I'm going to be rubbish at the aesthetics round oh, because I can't see, <laughs> because I'm blind. You've got a blind person. I'm going to be very quiet during the aesthetics round. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I totally forgot. David, I'm disability blind. I'm so woke. I don't even see people's disability. But you can you can do a good job describing the, the person. But as I've kind of got no visual, like, lands, like even, like, to go on so if you said oh he's got a a, a medium-sized nose i go well i i suppose that's good that i said he's got me i mean to be honest i'm as someone who's heterosexual i don't know why i'm saying he's got me you might have picked a man for me <laughs> i don't know <laughs> let's do this how, how we're talking about being woke how what do we want to go you're going to you're going to ask a heterosexual man to, to comment on a man from the past that he can't see and you forgot that i'm blind it's going to be a brilliant <laughs> podcast everyone <laughs> Strap yourselves Rock in. Rock and roll, baby. <laughs> hey, but at least you got the theme tune. We could, out of respect to David, eject the aesthetic round. Oh, I don't mind. Well, no, I think you should just uh, explain what she looks like. Okay. You've got your explaining chops on, haven't you? Indeed I have. It is so embarrassing. Literally, when I set up the WhatsApp group for the three of us earlier, I thought, and this will be convenient for when Kat sends the photo for us to look at. I'm so thick. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be brilliant if, when you send me this and I ask it to describe what it is, it tells me the, the person? Will it know? Yeah. I might do, actually. Oh, that's interesting. So I have just sent you uh, a picture of today's subject. Uh, this is her profile picture on eTrust, which is, of course, the entirely real and not made up for the purposes of this podcast dating application that our guest subjects are on. As we've already uh, established, David can't see, but luckily we've got uh, <laughs> an image description software that is going to tell us, and you, the listener, uh, what, what this individual looks like. Okay. Today. A boy sitting on a chair. What? A boy sitting on a chair? <laughs> It is a woman, I can assure you. But hey, okay. that tells you something about the woman. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we, we don't endorse uh, paedophilia, or indeed <laughs> hemophilia on this podcast we've been very clear to only pick people who are of age <laughs> you're trying to trick me here and i'm going to say oh yes i'd have sex and then you reveal at the end it's actually a boy what like, oh. what a colossal edgelord joke that would be to trick a blind man on a podcast <laughs> to saying yes i would have sex with oh guess what it was an eight-year-old boy the whole time <laughs> there's two things here it says a boy sitting on a chair, but then it also says person, a 42-year-old woman with black hair <laughs> looking neutral. She's looking neutral. So is there somebody else in the photo? No, this is one picture. And actually, yeah. oh. both descriptions kind of make sense because she has All a bit right. of a masculine look. She's doing something we traditionally associate with men. And yeah, actually looking at the face, it's from the 1920s or something. So my guess is she's probably actually about 19. But because it's the 1920s, she actually looks about 43. It's not a bad right. description, David. That's a good bit of software you've got over there. Eventually. I mean, it was absolutely wrong immediately. But eventually it was a good piece of software. <laughs> Are you, am I, are you allowed to reveal what this doing something associated with being a man well, is? I'll, des I'll describe the photo a bit more. So basically, it's a lady and she has uh, legs... Uh, wide open but in between her legs she has a football a big leathery football she has studded football boots on and essentially it's a football kit although the actual top half is not what we would today associate as being a football kit it's like a white collared shirt which I suppose is an unusual thing to play soccer in mm. she has short hair but it may be tied up at the back it's hard to tell it doesn't look unlike princess leia in the way she sort of tied it up on each side it's almost got that Princess Leia Star Wars bun thing going on side to side, mm. and then she's got a centre parting right down the middle, and uh, she's so. If you say neutral, I think she's smiling. 
And my guess is she is a mm -hmm. ye olden times soccer lady who's right. probably mm -hmm. in a good mood because she's about to have a kickabout with her fellow ladies. Well, but the question is, you were mentioning Leia. Will I Leia? Yes. And, center part well, yes. And, and will there be a centre parting in a different way? We'll find out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Bum cracks, yeah. David, you have got the tone of this podcast more than any guest we've had on so far. This is, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> from, from this image and description, many descriptions, would... Uh, would you be interested in this individual? And then we'll get to know her a bit. It's in, it's a, a polite no from me so far. I just feel like she looks like someone that would break my leg in a Sunday league football match. Yeah, I'm slightly mm -hmm. worried about that. You're saying that she's holding this ball between her legs and I'm thinking maybe she's going to... I'm quite thin and I'm not me sure. Too. She might... You know, she might get mm -hmm. me. It might, it might be too much for me. She looks tough. I'll say that. She does look like a tough, yeah. a tough lady. For a little weedy beta male like myself, I'm mm. quiv <laughs> quivering in my non-football boots. I mean, the thing is, you are both correct. Uh, and I also don't think that she would be that interested in you two. But this is uh, Lily. Uh, she's 20 and she's from St. Helens. Born on the 26th of April 1905 in St. Helens, Lily was the fourth of seven children to George and Sarah Parr. George worked as a labourer in a glass factory. It doesn't say what her mum did, but I guess she was a woman. And that's enough. <laughs> Lily was more interested in playing football and rugby with her brothers than pursuing traditional female interests like sewing and cooking. In 1919, at 14 years old, she started playing St. Helens ladies team. At the outbreak of World War I, men's football stopped, leading to an increased interest in women's football. A second game with St. Helens ladies was against, and this is the name of an engineering company, but fuck me, it's funny. Uh, Dick Kerr ladies in the last 6-1 <laughs> so at the time it was kind of like you would work at a factory and that factory would have a football team and that would kind of be an extension of the factory so it would be named after the factory that you worked at ah. for I guess advertising Dick Kerr ladies team scouted Lily and she joined along with her fellow teammate and future lover Alice Woods who was also part of St Helens ladies she was paid 10 shillings a game, which is £100 in today's money, which is still a lot at 14 yeah. years old. We've gigged for less. Well, yeah. She scored 43 goals in her first season with the team. Oh, wow. Which I think is a lot. Wow. Right, that's it. I'm having an out. <laughs> if it, <laughs> He's 40 back goals in. or more and I'm back in the game. She's going <laughs> to score again. If you guys had a workplace football team or sports team, do you reckon you'd get picked for it? I, I wouldn't get picked for it, no. Absolutely no. There's some very strapping young men and ladies at my work who would flatter me in the football field. I'm more likely to get picked for the uh, starting 11 Dungeons and Dragons improv team. That's kind of where my mm -hmm. physical prowess might be more suited. Would I make the works football team? Well, I suppose, what is my work? That's the thing. I mean, I don't really, I'm sort of more, I'm self-employed. I mean, it's entirely up to you then. How many people, <laughs> yeah. Again, the whole blindness thing. There's blind football though, isn't there? Got like a... Uh... Jingle balls inside it, right? Jingle I mean, balls? Yeah. <laughs> bells. <laughs> Jingle bells in the balls. Can you imagine taking Vuvu Zelas to a blind <laughs> football game? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again. Such a cunt. <laughs> But perhaps it'd be like a who wants to be, be a millionaire thing with that major work with a coughing where that people bring oh. vuvuzelas, but they have different pitches. And so what's happening is the sighted spectators, they blow the vuvuzela and the blind person hears it and they go, ah, that's an F sharp. Um, fourth octave F sharp that means the ball is more to my right and then it does a thing so you can do it like that oh short blast on the E on the E flat major there on the Vuvu -vu Zela <laughs> uh, that's obviously and then it gets discovered that there's a whole heist going on with the Vuvu -vu Zela there's a big scam I mean, I'm curious about this blind football. What I'd like to see is a pitch invasion at a blind football match where it's just like 10,000 people with guide sticks and guide dogs just slowly ambling onto the pitch. That'd be quite a fun Well, that's bit. what they'd call this. They would call it the pitch invasion because it's the Vuvuzelas doing different pitches. Exactly. So that's yes. what it would be. Got to be a headline in the paper. <laughs> Dick Kerr and Co. were a very popular team, regularly drawing large crowds and raising vast sums of money for charity. 
for example, the game on the 26th of December, more commonly known as Boxing Day, uh, <laughs> 1920, at Goodison Park against St. Helens Ladies, drew 53,000 spectators. Oh, what was the result? <laughs> drew 53,000 each? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was the largest gathering to watch women's football until the 2012 Olympics. Whoa. They won and raised the equivalent of around half a million pounds in today's money for the unemployed ex-servicemen's distress fund in Liverpool, oh. which is pretty good. I know that we, we did try and describe uh, Lily a little before, but here's one uh, from a, an actual writer. She's called Gail Newsham, and she wrote in her book on the team, In a League of Their Own, 1994, that Lily was standing almost six feet tall with jet black hair, her power and skill was admired and feared wherever she played. She was an extremely unselfish player who could pinpoint a pass with amazing accuracy and was also a marvellous ball player. And she was probably responsible in one way or another for most of the goals that were scored by the team. Her teammate John Wally said she had a kick like a mule. She was the only person I know. She's the only person I know who could lift a dead ball, the old heavy lever ball, from the left wing over to me on the right and nearly knocked me out with the force of the shot. When she took a left corner kick, it came over like a bullet. And if you've ever hit one of those on your head, I only ever did it once, and the laces on the ball left their impression, impression on my forehead and cut it open. Lily was noted for her large appetite, and she was constantly smoking woodbine cigarettes. <laughs> Probably why that uh, image recognition app thought she was 43. <laughs> imagine, I mean, imagine if this was all in the, 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 the strength of this person and the physical sort of things that she does. I think it's going to be quite incendiary to have sex with this woman, and especially if she's then smoking woodbines at the same time, and her mm-hmm. insatiable appetite. I'm really mm-hmm. not sure about this. Uh, are you back out again? I really respect her. I think she's brilliant, though. I'd love to have a conversation with her. You know, it'd be great to have a, a chat, because I think she seems absolutely brilliant, but I, I think she's it's going to be f- far too much for me. But we also know that, well, we don't necessarily know this, but we know that she is at least either bisexual or lesbian, don't we? Yes, I think she is lesbian. So she's not going to consent to it anyway. You're doing what Anivab did last week. We have ethics. Yeah, most people we get on this show uh, are egomaniacal enough to just already assume that the historical person would definitely have sex with them. But you and Anivab have gone in the direction, you're like, but would they consent to me? Which makes you incredibly woke. I always like to play the game, imagine I'm an early 19th, an early 20th century soccer playing lesbian. Uh, would oh. I, in that circumstance where she might say yes to me, would she? Oh, no, that's banging? different. Yeah. Oh, that's different. That yeah. That's a very different <laughs> spin on it. Suddenly his interest is peaks again. <laughs> Imagine you're a sapphic soccer player in 1925. That's what we're asking. If I had come back through time, though, and I could prove that I'd come back from the 21st century, then she might be interested because that's quite novel. Mm. So there's me and... Are you suggesting that time travel is enough to cure someone of their lesbianism? Because if so, no. that's quite a controversial... Uh, I mean, well, you said cure. You said cure. <laughs> <in Vernon. laughs> uh, so let's not play high and mighty here. Uh, well, I'm glad you've got five or six podcasts in the back because this could be the last one. <laughs> I'm never going to get on the Now Show now. Fuck. Um, sorry, I'll rephrase that. Are you suggesting time travel could rob someone of their of their lesbianism? Are you suggesting that just the mere sight of uh, Doctor Who and not the Jodie Whittaker Doctor Who, the male Doctor Who's, would turn a historical lesbian? Well, it's more just the novelty of it, isn't it? So even if you're mm. not doing it because of the attraction, if you could say to your mates, or oh, by the way, I had sex with uh, a man from the 21st century. I mean, fairness, they probably wouldn't believe you. <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, did you? Is that what he said? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to put my mind to it. Now, hang on. If someone came from the future, there was a man who was gay, would that turn me? I guess I'm trying to put myself in it. I suppose they might if they properly blew my mind with something. I don't know what it would be. Like, it would have to be some unfathomable technology, like, say, what a smartphone might be to, to, to Lily or an AI butler comes, comes with them. Is that enough to make me bum a man? I don't know. Maybe. Or some football, like some lightweight football boots that they have now that they wouldn't have had maybe then. So their football playing would be even better. Yes. And so I could trade that for her body. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, just for the record, I would fuck anything uh, that came from the future <laughs> and told me so. Man, lady, or animal. If it's from the future, mm-hmm, cat's going to bang it. In 1920, a local newspaper wrote about 14-year-old Lily. There is probably no greater football prodigy in the whole country. Not only has she spe- speed and excellent ball control, but her admirable physique enables her to brush off challenges from defenders who tackle her. She amazes the crowd wherever she goes by the way she swings the ball clean across the goal mouth to the opposite wing. Women's football continued in its popularity following the First World War and raised considerable sums of money for charity. In 1920, they played a series of matches against the French ladies. Ooh la la. Uh, in a game at Stamford Bridge, they lost 2-1. They caused a stir when the two mm. captains, Ellis Cal and Madeline. Hello, Aiden again here. That audio clipping that I mentioned with Kath earlier resulted in us losing some of the information she said there. The names of the captains that kissed were Alice Kell and Madeline Bracamond. And yeah, they kissed each other at the end of the match and it caused a stir. That's what Kath was saying. Anyway, back to the episode. Two captains went for a little kiss, wow. kissy kiss. Uh, and I am all for it. Uh, I think that should happen at every match. I would watch football if there was more kissing. Uh, mouth to mouth kisses. <laughs> was this a polite chase into a kiss, or was it like, was it passful? Yeah, is, is this what, what's causing the controversy here? I think just two women kissing was the controversy. Yeah. In public, shoving it down our throat or whatever I mean, you know, the gammons say. Which only straight people are allowed to do. Yeah, yeah, straight people can shove whatever down your throat. <laughs> a straight guy can shove his cock down your throat and it, it, it won't affect his day. But if two uh, gay guys hold hands in uh, in next, the world's going to pot. I'm all for this post-match kiss. There's quite a lot of popular ladies football. That's getting quite popular now, isn't it? I, I won't lie, I'm for it. Mm-hmm. But I'm not enough to watch it. But if they were going like, to, I don't know, finger blast each other on the goal line at the 90th minute, oh, I'll, be, I'll be there, don't you worry about that. I'd watch more men's football if they all just had a big, you know, oh, gang at the end of it. Yeah, yeah, I'd be well in for that. Yeah, like Harry Kane tossing off Messi. You'd be, you'd be, come on, get the VAR on the go. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the team was so po- <laughs> the team was so popular that in 1921, their manager Alfred Franklin had to turn down 120 invitations for them to play all over Britain. Alice Norris said. It was sometimes hard work when we played a match during the week because we'd have to work in the morning, travel to play the match, and travel home again and be up early for work the next day. In March 1921, miners were hit with a 50% pay cut due to privatisation of the mines. They refused and as such were locked out of their jobs with the government drafting soldiers in to do their work. Women's football began to raise money for the miners and that did not go down well with the man. Football Association announced in December 1921 that complaints have been made uh, as to football being played by women. The council feel impelled to express their strong opinion, of course they fucking did, that the game of football is quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. Complaints have been made as to the conditions under which some of these matches have been arranged and played and the appropriation of the receipts to other than charitable objects. The council are further of the opinion that an excessive proportion of the receipts are absorbed in expenses and an inadequate percentage devoted to charitable objects. For these reasons, the council requests that clubs belonging to the association refuse the use of their grounds for such matches. Luckily, we learnt lessons from this 1921 uh, crisis with the miners and there was never any issues with the miners again. And that is the most important thing. But... Because the women's football were helping to support them through their strike, the Football Association said, you're not allowed to play football anymore in our stadiums. Hang on, I'm a bit confused. There's a lot of information there. So are you saying that they they were trying to shut down women's football because it was associated with strike action? Uh, They were giving money, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're okay. raising money to support the strikers. Yeah. And then, so then they did a sort of side objection, like, oh, these women are playing football. Was it that they were offended by the sight of women stepping out of their lane and then used a minor thing as an excuse uh, to shut it down? Or was it like a twofold thing? Yeah, essentially. So uh, it was kind of like in the war when, you know, the men went off and the women had to fill the roles. They kind of hoped that the women would quietly just go back into the kitchen and stop doing this now and the men would come back in. And then people were like, well, actually, we have been watching women's football for years now and we quite enjoy it. And they're raising money for people who need it. Yeah. They've done good things and they're very good football players. So I'm just going to stay 
supporting these guys actually and uh, the man did not like that and then I think just the, the miners were a, uh, a cheeky bonus. This kind of attitude pisses me off. It sort of reminds me a bit of when reactionary conservatives react to something that is in no way affecting them whatsoever, like, say, gay marriage. They'll make arguments mm. like, w- what about the children? And it's like, don't bring your fucking mm-hmm. children into this. Don't make this seem like... Your children don't give a shit, and they're only going to give a shit because you tell them to. If you just tell them that, it's absolutely fine. If you tell them that, it's okay for a lady who works in a factory to kick a leather ball about a football pitch on a Saturday, they will be fine with it because you have informed them that it is fine for it. If you tell your kids you have two uncles <laughs> and no aunties yeah. in that mix because Uncle John and Uncle Matt love each other very much, they'll just sort of quietly accept it and move on with their lives. It's always the parents who are more afraid than the children. Yeah, baby. As Barbara Jacobs pointed out in the Dick Care Ladies, which I believe is a book, women's football had come to be associated with charity and had its own credibility. Now it was used as a tool to help the labour movement and the trade unions. It had, it could be said, become a politically dangerous sport to those who felt the trade unions to be their enemies. Women went out to support their menfolk, a Lancashire tradition, was causing ripples in a society which wanted women to revert to their pre- pre-war roles as set down by their masters, of keeping their place, that place being in the home and the kitchen. Alfred Franklin, the manager of the team, decided to take them to Canada and to the US to play. Arriving in Quebec on the 22nd of December 1922, they found that the Dominion Football Association had banned them from playing the Canadian teams. They were accepted in the States, though, visiting Boston, Baltimore, St. Louis, Washington, Detroit, Chicago and Philadelphia, winning six out of nine games. An American newspaper described Lily as the most brilliant female player in the world. Dick Kerr ladies continued to play football in England, but without access to proper grounds, they weren't able to raise funds as they had done previously. Dick Kerr Engineering was eventually taken over by English Electric, who refused to sub- subsidise the team and told Franklin that he would no longer be allowed time off to run the team. So he left and opened a shop with his wife in Sharrow Green Lane in Preston, where they sold fish and green groceries, continuing to manage the team that was now known as Preston Ladies. I fucking adore that. Yeah. We won't give you time off for football. All right, bye. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. This, is there, has there been a film made about this? Because this seems like it should be a great TV series or film. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a, a wonderful documentary on Channel 4 hosted by Claire Balding. Uh, who else? called When Football Banned Women. No, mm. When Women Banned Football. Uh, <laughs> when Football Banned Women. And that was a really interesting documentary. It was a source material for this. Mm. Uh, and there was also a play at Soho Theatre. I cannot remember the name of it, but it touched upon Lily Park. But I, I don't know that there has been a series or anything, but that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Like a historical Ted Lasso type thing. Mm. <laughs> Ted Lasso. I mean, I'm not saying this podcast isn't enough, but, you know, you're doing a good job. I'm doing my own Google image search here on oh. uh, Lily Parr. Mm-hmm. I think that photo sells her short. The, the one you sent, the, the mm-hmm. one that was in the e there. there. Ah. Just sent another little picture of uh, Lily Parr there. What does your voice, uh, rec- your picture analyzer say of that, David? Okay, it says, A woman in a baseball uniform, 35-year-old woman with black hair, Looking neutral. She's looking neutral again. Love this looking neutral thing. Yeah. But there, that's that. That You're right, Aidan. That is a better, not only from your own perspective, but the algorithm agrees. She's looking younger. She's a woman in this one, not a boy. That's not another one. So I'm getting really into her now. <laughs> Find another one. Yeah, that's her in her beanie. Yeah, no, she's cute. I think she's quite cute. But now, now that I'm looking at pictures of her when she was mm-hmm. actually young and not looking like a 42-year-old woman... Uh, but maybe that maybe that photo, the first photo, maybe it was taken directly after a match when someone's looking a bit, you know, exhausted. I think she's a pretty lady. Here we go. A woman in a hat. 31-year-old. My goodness, Aidan, you're giving me the good <laughs> stuff now. Oh, yes. 31-year-old wearing a hat, looking neutral. Again, we can't find a one where she's not looking neutral. <laughs> She looks quite happy in that one. Why is it looking at every photo of her and going, this lady is the human equivalent of Switzerland? That This app is obsessed with <laughs> the neutrality of this woman. It's bizarre. I think 31 yeah, exactly. is a harsh sell on that photo. 
because it's old and low mm-hmm. it's hard to tell. But honestly, she could be anywhere from 17 to 22 in that photo. I definitely wouldn't put her as a 31-year-old. If she's 31 there, she's a damn good-looking 31-year-old. Kath's a 31-year-old. She looks way younger than Kath. Yeah, well, almost 31. Why don't you send, send me one of Kath? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens here. See, see what the fucking thing's got to say about that. No, because it'll just say it'll just say a 31-year-old red-haired woman with a, what's the word, a neutral look on her face. <laughs> so the, the takeover uh, of the workplace of Ditka uh, Engineering to English Electric, it meant that some of the players also lost their jobs. God damn it. Uh, the team had raised a significant sum of money for the Whittingham Cos- Hospital and Lunatic Asylum, I don't think it's called that anymore, over the years. And they were only too happy to take on workers at the hospital. Lily eventually became a ward sister and met her partner Mary whilst working there. They bought a house together in Preston. Preston ladies continued to be the best team in England, beating Blackpool 11-2 in 1927. The record was pretty amazing. In a speech, Alfred Franklin said, Since our inception, we have played 437 matches. Won 424, lost 7 and drawn 6 scored 2,863 goals and only had 207 scored against us. We have raised over £100,000 in this country and in foreign lands for charity. We have won 14 silver cups. In 1946, Lily was made captain to recognise her 26 years of service, having only missed five games. Whoa. That's insane. People just made up harder stuff back then. Yeah. Wild. Mm. I have cancelled five gigs this year. <laughs> for, like the sniffles. Yeah, exactly. I get a man cold. Boom! Not gigging for the next month. I'm not driving to Hastings. <laughs> <that. laughs> She's probably like pulling muscles and like spraining herself, and it's just like, so I, I'll just hobble around, and she still somehow manages to score uh, a hat trick. Yeah. They used to play with a pig's bladder, didn't they? How much piss can a pig fit inside? <laughs> I don't know if the piss was still in it. <laughs> That would make the game a lot more interesting, wouldn't it? There'd be fewer <laughs> people going for headers. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the term piss-poor performance comes from. Hey! Ah, official, hey. official fact for you there. <laughs> well, I think this woman is absolutely wonderful. I think she's a wonderful person. So I'm really glad that I've been made aware of her. Even though it did, even yeah. though the the context of this is is very much sort of lasciviousness, uh, I I think it's brilliant person. So we'll say that about her definitely. I agree. She she's is. cute. She can kick a ball. I don't care if she's <laughs> covered in pig Pig's piss. piss. I'm still interested. <laughs> yeah. In spite of the pig piss. I would, oh, not I would in say. spite not of me. Of I, I hadn't even considered the pig's piss. If she's covered <laughs> in pig's piss, again, definitely. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm in. so uh, Lily played her last game on the 12th of August 1950 aged 45 scoring a goal in the 11-1 victory against Scotland 15 years later in 1965 Preston ladies folded five years after that in 1970 the FA lifted its ban on women's football that is so fucking late in the day yeah Lily retired from the hospital in the early 1960s, developing cancer in 1967. She had a double mastectomy and refused to give up smoking. That's my girl. On the 24th <laughs> of May 1978, she died at home. Just before going any further, I'd like to thank Spartacus Educational and When Football Band Women as our sources, so we do not get sued. Uh, but the big question here is, would you bang our friend Lily Parr? David, you first. I think you've already answered, but... Feel free I mean, to add anything else here. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be any sexual chemistry there. But no. I think she's a wonderful person. But if hypothetically there was sexual chemistry, either you're a time traveling lesbian or something, and she's into that, would uh, would you? Uh, I feel like there are too many hypotheticals there that stretch <laughs> stretch credulity so much that it would be untenable for me to answer. Which is the more hypothetical that you're a lesbian or that you're a time traveller? I don't know. I now know how politicians feel. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very simple well, just, question. Just give me a yes or a no. Jeremy Paxman there asking Michael uh, how the same question 14 times. Just tell me, is it more <laughs> is it more fantastical that you'll be a time traveller or more fantastical that you'll be a lesbian? Just answer the question. The British public need to know. It's you, a quite you straight yes or no. Question, and I would, I would give you, no I would give you so it's a gentle no from David due to circumstance. Which I think she would be 
very happy about my decision as well. Yes, I agree. Excellent. So it's down to me, I guess, to decide whether or not she, this lady Lily Parr, gets on the biotap latistry with such fellow hot historical luminaries as Joseph II, Jane Fall, and uh, the Shroud of Turin. And the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a yes. I actually think she's cute. Ooh. I think the initial photo undersold her. I think she's actually a very attractive woman, uh, which was the uh, quick Google search will reveal that. And she's cool. She's sticking it to the man. She's breaking down uh, accepted social boundaries, both in her war- wartime work and then after that with a footballing career. I mean, she'd probably destroy me. She would almost certainly just tap me in the shin and break it because she's a hard bastard football player. See, I assume you would, Kath. I assume that's why you're pitching it to us. Yeah, that's why I'm telling you about her. <laughs> uh, I, I just needed the thumbs up. I absolutely would. Uh, she's She's awesome. Uh, I love her dearly. She's cool. Yeah, a trailblazer. Uh, which I hate saying that. It's just like, oh, well, she was gay when it wasn't okay to be like, beans. Well, you know, that, that doesn't make you brave, does it? It just makes you a person. Absolutely. I admire her. Wonderful. So, Lily Paul makes it onto the BO Tap Latistry at two to one. At the time of recording this episode, David did not have a tour book, so when we asked him at the end of the episode, is there anything you'd like to promote, there was nothing to promote, but now there is. Uh, if you go to his website, davideagle.co.uk forward slash gigs, you can see he's doing a sort of mini tour of the UK. It's a 90 minute show of comedy and music, and it's called Flying Solo. He is absolutely brilliant live. I've gigged with him. He's very funny. He's very quickly becoming a a headline actor in the UK. And you would do uh, very well for yourself if you go and see him. So yes, check that out. So, uh, Lily Parr will end up on the Be Your Tap Latter Street, two to one. Uh, David Eagle, it's been a pleasure to have you as a guest. Have you got anything to plug? The best thing to do it will just be to follow me on social media, the David Eagle or davideagle.co.uk is my website. And you're on TikTok and Instagram? Yes, I'm on all of that. Yeah, yeah. And is that, are they all the David Eagle? Yep. Lovely stuff. Uh, spread the word, spread your legs, and remember, it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside of the coffin that counts. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You have been listening to Historical Hot or Not, written and created by Aidan McCaffrey and Catherine Mather. The podcast art was by our good friend Richard Todd, and our theme music by excellent musician and also good friend David Eagle. We also have music by Ergo Fismas, Matter License from the Free Music Archive. If you've enjoyed us and you would like to donate to the cause, we would love you to do that also. You can find us at ko-fi.com forward slash hotnotpod and you can download bonus episodes of Historical Hot or Not from Acast Plus. The link is available on our link tree, linktree.com forward slash hotnotpod. Bye!